Greetings all, Ferrariman601 here. Today is May 1st, and of course this is a date that is indelibly etched in the minds of all motorsport fans around the world. May 1st, 1994 at the San Marino Grand Prix is of course the day on which we lost Ayrton Senna, undoubtedly one of the greatest racing drivers ever to get behind the wheel of a car. Undoubtedly one of the most famous, most recognizable personalities in the history of Formula One, and undoubtedly the events of Imola 1994 have been etched in history for their infamy, for the deaths of Roland Ratzenberger on April 30th and Ayrton Senna the following day during the Grand Prix, a very serious accident involving Rubens Barrichello on the Friday in a practice session also marred the weekend, and after Senna's crash, an errant wheel in a pit stop also injured mechanics in the pit lane working there. So, 1994, the San Marino Grand Prix, it was not a good day. And it's one that everybody still talks about, those who were there. The crowd is slowly beginning to dwindle a little bit in terms of the drivers and spectators and commentators who were there on the day and witnessed the events. But... Here we are in 2019, once again, looking at Imola 1994, as we always do on the 1st of May. What I want to do with this video, though, is not glorify the events, not overly criticize the events either, but rather take a look at the car that is at the center of the occurrences of that fateful weekend, the Williams FW16. This car gets a reputation that, in many respects, it deserves in being the last car that Ayrton Senna drove and being the car that Ayrton Senna was driving when he died. However, there are some misconceptions about it. It has had these events of Imola 1994 blemish its reputation, and it's not entirely one that it deserves. The Williams FW16, here it is, in 118th scale by Mini Champs. I've had this model for about 10 years. In fact, if you go all the way back through the playlists, the uh, 118th scale model car playlist on my channel, you'll find a video of this car that I put up in, I believe, 2010. So it has been featured before, but not since. And as a matter of fact, I can't recall the last time that I actually took it out of its Brazilian flag grape box there. So it's not one that I look at very often. Uh, quite honestly, I'm not quite sure why I have it, only uh, due to the fact that it is the car that it is. And I think that uh, if you're in a position to be collecting these things and you have the opportunity to have one, I think you would be best served to have one because if you're going to have a, a collection of Formula One cars, historic ones, uh, whether they're famous or infamous, I, I think this one deserves a place in it. But... I say that this car is infamous, but I don't necessarily mean it. Yes, it is. And undoubtedly, the events of Imola 94 can not be separated from what this car is. But trying to insulate it as best as we can with the number two on it and with Ayrton Senna's helmet there in the cockpit, what it really is, is Williams 1994 Formula One car designed by Patrick Head and Adrian Newey. Yes, that Patrick Head and that Adrian Newey. It's an evolution of the FW14 and FW15C that raced in 1992 and 1993. The big difference between 16 and 15 was that for the 1994 season, the FIA banned all sorts of electronic aids that were helping the drivers control the cars and helping the designers and aerodynamicists create a more stable and consistent platform, aerodynamically speaking. Therefore, the FIA said, anti-lock brakes, gone. Traction control, gone. Launch control, gone. Active suspension, gone. Also, to add to the fun, refueling, welcome back. So, we have a car that is passive. It's once again a passive or conventional car in that it has a sprung suspension that can only react to what the conditions are out on track versus act in a proactive fashion anticipating what the loads are going to be. 
all the control is now back in the hands of the driver, anti-lock brakes are gone, traction control is gone, therefore it is all down to the driver's skill and the driver's good judgment to put everything right in order to get the best performance. Patrick Head and Adrian Newey, of course, they had also designed FW14, FW14B, and FW15C, and of course, they designed those cars around traction control, around anti-lock brakes, and around active suspension. So, when they were forced to remove all of those things from FW16 in 1994, they were pretty much left with their hands tied behind their backs because they designed this car from the outset to take advantage of all of those sophisticated electronic systems, and now they're banned. So the end result was a car that was fundamentally unstable at the beginning of the season, and we can see this with Senna's results in Brazil and at the Pacific Grand Prix in Japan, Senna having really hard times with this car, spinning off on several occasions. In Japan, he was punted off in the first corner, so we're really unable to see what he would have done there. But for the start of the European rounds of the championship, San Marino at the Imola circuit in Imola, Italy, Senna quoted as saying, well, his championship now has two fewer races. The season starts now at Imola. And Ayrton Senna was pretty cautious, but also optimistic, and I believe that he had reason to be optimistic for his prospects remaining in 1994. He understood by this point what the challenges in the car were going to be. Remember, Senna was also new to Williams. He moved over from McLaren at the end of 1993. So Senna getting acquainted with his new team, getting acquainted with a new car, and now learning that the tools that he was going to have to play with in this car, which had been so dominant in his previous iterations, are now going to be removed entirely, and it's now back to basics in terms of trying to get this race car to go as fast as possible. The car's construction entirely conventional in terms of what we were seeing at the time. We have a carbon fiber monocoque replete with the fuel tank and the cockpit area, the safety cell for the driver, all designed to the regulations, passing crash tests and all of that stuff. The suspension, double wishbone push rod front and rear suspension as you would expect in this era. Nothing unconventional there. Overall dimensions on the car the axle track at the front, that's the width, is 1,670 millimeters. At the rear, it's slightly narrower at 1,590 millimeters. The wheelbase, 2,920 millimeters. And the engine, it's a 3.5 liter V10 provided by Renault. It's RS6 in its A, B, and C specifications. A 67 degree bank angle on that engine, putting out about 750 to 780 horsepower. The gearbox was a six-speed semi-automatic designed in-house by Williams, mounted transversely behind the engine. Fuel, as we can see here, provided by ELF, and the tires were Goodyear, as we can see here. Of course, everybody knows what this car is, and everybody knows what it looks like due to the endless replays that we see of Ayrton's accident at Imola. However, looking beyond that, we have a car that was driven by Ayrton Senna, obviously, but also by such names as Damon Hill, Nigel Mansell, and David Coulthard. David Coulthard and Damon Hill would carry the baton for most of the rest of the season. Nigel Mansell came in to drive the Williams for, I believe, the last two rounds of the championship, and quite famously, he won the Australian Grand Prix at Adelaide in this car, and that turned out to be Nigel Mansell's last Formula One victory. The car made its debut, of course, at the 1994 Brazilian Grand Prix, which was the season opener in that year. And out of 16 races contested, it won 7 of them, took a total of 13 podium finishes, 6 pole positions, and 8 fastest laps. It won the Constructors' Championship in 1994 for Williams. It lost out on the Drivers' Championship, though. Michael Schumacher and Damon Hill coming together at Adelaide, the final round of the season, quite controversially. Michael Schumacher got it wrong, punted the wall, realized he had broken the car, cut across in front of Damon Hill. Michael Schumacher gets launched into the air, into the barrier, but in the process, he also fatally damages the Williams of Damon Hill. With Hill and Schumacher failing to finish the Australian Grand Prix, Michael Schumacher wins his first Drivers' Championship. 
The fact that Damon Hill was able to harry Michael Schumacher, and of course we know what Michael Schumacher would go on to achieve in his very long Formula One career, but the fact that Damon Hill was in contention for the 1994 World Championship right up to the final round up against Michael Schumacher, that means, quite unequivocally I must say, that Ayrton Senna, had he lived, would have won the 1994 World Championship over Michael Schumacher fairly easily. If Hill was able to harry Schumacher to the final round, I have no doubt whatsoever that Ayrton Senna would have won that World Championship, probably with a race or two to spare. Of course, when we're talking about this car, we do have to talk about what happened at Imola on lap 7 of the San Marino Grand Prix. Ayrton Senna crosses start-finish to begin the lap. He is leading the race. Michael Schumacher is about a second and a half, two seconds behind at this point. The race started, and then immediately there was a very big start-line crash involving some of the cars at the back. Debris thrown all over the circuit. A wheel from one of the cars involved in the incident was thrown into the grandstand over on the left-hand side of the circuit. So, a big to-do at the start of this race. Typically in a situation like this, in years gone by, a red flag would be thrown, the grid reformed, and the race restarted with drivers, if able, taking spare cars if their cars had been damaged in the initial start line incident to the point where they could no longer take part. However, another new rule for 1994 was that the safety car was going to be deployed whenever possible in order to intervene in any larger accidents going on around the circuit. This would keep the race happening so the cars would remain circulating, the laps behind the safety car would count, just the pace would be reduced. The safety car though was nowhere near fast enough to keep these Formula One cars up to speed and more importantly to keep the tires and brakes fully up to temperature. The safety car was out for quite a few laps following that start line incident and by the time the safety car came back in on lap 6, pretty much all the tires on all the cars were down to ambient temperature. So. These cars are very sensitive, of course, to temperatures and tire pressures. The ride heights are very low to begin with, and with the tire temperatures and pressures as low as they were after the safety car period, it's safe to say that these cars were running too low. However, lap 6 happens, the restart happens, Senna leads away from Schumacher, and Senna completes lap 6 without incident. Lap 7, though, Senna crosses start-finish. He turns into the very fast left-hand corner, Tamburello. Remember, this is Imola before the chicane was put in at Tamburello in reaction to what happened with Ayrton Senna and his accident in 94. So Tamburello is entirely flat out for this car. be flat in sixth gear, apex speed around there, about 300 kilometers an hour, if not a little bit higher than that, and then a fast blast down to the Tosa corner. There was no Villeneuve chicane either at this point, so it was completely flat out from the exit of the Traguardo, that's the chicane, going up to start finish all the way down to the breaking point for Tosa. So the first 20 seconds or so of the lap, completely flat out, hard on the throttle, going up into sixth gear. So Tamburello, it's a corner that's taken flat out, and there's no runoff. You have a small area of paved uh, concrete followed by gravel, and then you have a concrete wall. No tire barriers, nothing of the sort. For reasons that we still do not entirely understand, although we all have our theories, and I, I think we all know mostly what happened with this incident, as Ayrton Senna turns into Tamburello, the car initially turns in and reacts normally. However, about halfway through the corner, the car suddenly bolts straight ahead on a tangent line relative to the radius of the corner. This means that no more turning force is being applied to the car. This means that the steering is no longer effective. Whatever the case is that led to the failure of the steering column, perhaps we know, perhaps we don't. We'll get into some theories in a moment, but Senna's car shoots off at a tangent angle relative to the apex of the corner and it impacts the barriers on the outside of Tamburello. As Senna's car impacts the barriers, the chassis and monocoque, they hold up just fine. However, because the car sandwiched the right-hand suspension between the barrier and the side of the monocoque, the right front wheel and its associated suspension elements came up 
into the cockpit area and impacted Ayrton's helmet. They uh, created quite a substantial divot in the helmet and there's also a penetration of the helmet visor as well by some suspension components. Ayrton Center received massive head injuries which turned out to be fatal very quickly. The amount of speculation and the amount of intrigue that resulted from this incident was bolstered almost immediately by Italian law in that in the event that a competitor dies in a sporting event, the sporting event must be immediately cancelled and nullified. Well, the FIA did not want to cancel the San Marino Grand Prix, especially after it had already started, so they insisted that Senna not be declared dead until after the race was over. They also insisted on him being transported to a hospital in Bologna and being kept on life support, even though even uh, Professor Sid Watkins, the uh, the now deceased FIA medical director at the time, he assessed Senna trackside and he could tell just from the dilation of Senna's pupils that he had suffered a severe head injury and uh, in later interviews later on in life Professor Watkins says that he felt Senna's spirit leave him in that moment so you have an illustrious surgeon declaring him dead on the track the FIA does not want to stop the race because of a legal incongruity between how it runs its affairs and how the Italians want to run their affairs in their country so Senna's kept on life support in the hospital and then pronounced dead later on. At the same time, the Italians immediately launch a legal case against Formula One and eventually against the Williams Grand Prix team because they designed the car that killed the driver. Of course, they were later exonerated from all charges, I believe by 1997. And then by that point, the car, which had been impounded by the Italians, was released back to Williams, who subsequently destroyed it. So in terms of us being able to identify anything that happened on the car conclusively that caused the incident, we'll never truly know unless some archives from the Italian magistrates are released someday. However, one thing that was uncovered in the investigation was the fact that the steering column had broken. Williams officially say that the steering column broke after impact with the wall. The onboard footage from Senna's car, there was a camera mounted just behind the cockpit adjacent to the air snorkel there for the engine air intake. There's a camera mounted there and it shows quite clearly two very important things. The steering wheel is deflecting in all sorts of odd directions inside the cockpit. The steering wheel obviously needs to be able to turn left and right, but it's fixed about a center of rotation. The steering wheel in Senna's onboard at Imola, beginning lap 7, it is not only turning left to right about the center as you would expect a steering wheel to do, but it is also pivoting upwards, downwards, and left and right laterally relative to the center of where the uh, hub of the steering wheel is. So it's rotating about its central axis, but it is also pivoting longitudinally. That's not normal. If you look at the front wheels of Senna's car in this onboard, right before it miraculously cuts off, again, another conspiracy theory perhaps, you see that the front wheels immediately turn into a straight position, as Senna is still turning to the left. This is indicative to me of a broken steering column. Not after the car hits the wall, but well before, and indeed it could be the contributing factor to the accident. Nobody will go on record saying that. Nobody from Williams has ever said it. The Italians have never said it, but I'm going to say it because that's what the video says. And that's the best evidence we seem to have. But regardless of whatever caused the steering column to break, we can conclusively say that the Williams FW16 was not responsible for the accident. It was not something that was baked into the design of the car. The steering column broke because it had been modified at Senna's request, supposedly. He wanted the steering column to be a little bit longer so he could have the steering column a little bit farther away from the dashboard. Looking at the cockpit design in this car, you can see that it's very tight. It's even tighter than a modern cockpit because the monocoque actually comes arrears into the cockpit area a bit more and the driver's hands are actually underneath the cockpit surround. This is a design feature which uh, was common in the day. We don't really see it anymore. But it's what Senna had to contend with, and he didn't like this so much. He wanted his hands to be a little bit farther away from the cockpit surround, away from the dashboard. So they lengthened the steering column, and they did it by cutting an existing steering column in half 
welding in uh, a section of steel pipe and then welding it back together to lengthen the column. Obviously, when you cut any sort of material and then you reassemble it or you reattach it to wherever it was attached to previously, you're going to induce an inherent weakness, an inherent flexibility, an inherent lack of rigidity in that material. Obviously, the stresses that were going through this Williams through Tamburello at maximum speed, at maximum downforce over the bumps, were too much for the welded joint in the steering column. It failed sent a loss control of the car, and the rest is history. However, that is a modification. That's something that's done sloppily, yes, but something that's done at the driver's request, and it's not something that came standard with the Williams FW16. Therefore, I cannot say in good conscience that Williams, in the design of the FW16, was culpable for the death of Ayrton Senna. The modification made to the car likely caused the accident, but the car itself did not suffer a failure. Therefore, that's the cause of the incident. And therefore, as in addition to what happened later on in the season with the car's competition history and the fact that it won the Constructors' Championship, this car does not deserve the reputation that it has nowadays as being the car that killed Seta. It's not. It happened that he was driving the car when he had his fatal accident. But the car is not at fault. It does not deserve the reputation that it has. Indeed, you can never separate it from the events of that day, but at the same time, only to focus on that is to miss most of the story. And although it is a tragic circumstance, it's not at all the whole story. This car won the Constructors' Championship. It was driven by two other world champions, Nigel Mansell and Damon Hill it was driven by a multiple Grand Prix winner and McLaren driver and eventual rival to Michael Schumacher, David Coulthard. The competition history and the people who drove it, in addition to Ayrton Senna, definitely warrant it a better place in history than the one that it has. And also its lineage, it's related to two of the most dominant Formula One cars in Grand Prix history, FW14 and FW15. So, again... From a design standpoint, it's designed by Adrian Newey. Yes, the guy who designed the McLarens that won the World Championships. The guy who designed the Red Bulls that won four on the trot between 2010 and 2013. That Adrian Newey. He also designed this car. Therefore, it's also related to championship winners of more recent eras. So again, does it really deserve its poor reputation? I will let you be the judge of that. Now moving away from all of the doom and gloom and dreariness, let's just take a look at the model for the sake of being a model. This in 118th scale by Mini Champs. It is of course part of the official Ayrton Senna collection by Mini Champs, and uh, all of these of course are officially licensed by the Ayrton Senna Foundation and of course by Williams. And I believe that a, a portion of the proceeds of the sales of these models do go back to the Ayrton Senna Foundation and they support charitable causes all around the world. So again, uh, it's officially given the blessing by the Senna family and it does uh, have some benefits to perhaps some uh, charitable causes. So yeah, they do still make these. They make them in limited numbers, but they are still in and out of production. I don't know when the last production run was on these, but I know that you can still get them. There's, it's a little haphazard, but they're not super limited, uh, unlike some others, but you can get them. There are no opening features on this car, as you might expect. Mini Champs cars tend not to have too many opening features, uh, particularly their Formula One cars, but it is a very nice reproduction of the FW16. The livery, of course, it's in its uh, blacked out anti-tobacco legislation version here. Obviously, you would have had Rothmans all up and down the sides of the car here in the engine cover and then the side pods, but we just have the barcoding there. Because, of course, they have to market these to children in some cases, so you don't want cigarettes being uh, consumed by children, I suppose, so that's what they do. But uh, all the other sponsorship graphics are here, Renault, Elf, and then, of course, uh, we have driver names and numbers and all kinds of things going on here. It's a pretty conventional car in terms of 1994 standards, even though Williams, they were the class leader of the season. And uh, this car turned out to be the most dominant 
and the most successful. It uh, doesn't really have too many new design uh, elements for the 1994 season. It's, again, just an evolution, more or less, of what they had going on in 1992 and 1993. Uh, it's a little bit more compact than the uh, FW14, for example. Just things have been refined a little bit more and lines have been smoothed out, but for the most part, it is still basically the same car as FW14. So it's it's interesting, and again, we still see this today in Formula One. Look at the uh, Ferrari SF90 right now. It's effectively the same car as the SF70H. So it's uh, it's it's different, but at the same time, it's very similar. So it's uh, it's a give and take game that Formula One designers play. And of course, when you have a good design, you don't want to throw everything away just because the calendar flipped over. So they take what they can, and then they modify what they can't. So it's it's always a compromise game between trying to get a new advantage over your rivals versus uh, maintaining things that you know work. So that's what Williams did with this car in this era. We're going to let the car come around a little bit more, show you around in the cockpit area. Again, we're not talking about the same sorts of detail that you'd get from some other modeling companies, but we do get some nice detail. Loud beep coming. There we go. And uh, now looking into the cockpit, there we are. We do have a little bit of a dashboard displayed in there. Uh, nothing too extravagant, simply because of the limitations of uh, the price point on this model. Not necessarily the scale, because uh, we do have some other cars available that do have some absolutely wild detail going on in the cockpits. But uh, you can see what's going on. Steering wheel in there. LCD dashboard behind. Again, it's a little bit difficult to see what's going on, but there you go. You can see a little bit of the uh, the graduations there showing the tachometer inside. So you do get a fair amount of detail. You also get the wing mirrors, of course, and they have the reflective tape in there to represent the glass inside the mirror. So that all does work, and that's uh, pretty nice. Uh, also, what works in this car is the light goes away, the steering, probably can't see the steering wheel anymore, but the uh, steering wheel is connected to the front wheels, and you can maybe just barely see it rotating in there. Of course, also in the car, you have got Ayrton Senna. We have got his helmet modeled here with all of his personal sponsors, the, uh, the uh, National Bank of Brazil, and then his Senna logo down there as well as he had in the era, and then of course the driver's suit with uh, more team sponsors on it. Very cool. That would be uh, Banco Nacional uh, de Brazil, I think. And then uh, some more sponsorship details there. Seat belts there, they're just decals, they're not fabric belts at all, and in fact they don't even look scale correct, but uh, they are represented there. Senna's arms as well represented, they, uh, they're they a little bit rectangular honestly, but they're in there, and again it's, it's really tight inside the cockpit here, so it's not an area that you really see too much of, and it's, it's decently represented I have to say. On the left hand side of the car you can see the uh, fuel nozzle here where the fuel hose would connect into. It's just a sticker. It's not actually a nozzle built into the car. So yeah, some cost cutting on this model, but it's it's here. And again, it uh, it's just one that I think you have to have just because of what it is and who it is and why, but it's 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 okay. Down here on the diffuser, see the floor detail. Uh, you can see the exhaust outlets through there. Yep, there we go. Exhaust blowing in this era, of course. And of course, that became even more important with uh, the deletion of the active suspension. You no longer control the ride height underneath here. Notice the absence of a rain light between the support pylons for the rear wing. That actually comes up here on the back of the engine covers where they uh, chose to put their rain light, Williams that does have a clear plastic cover, so not too bad. And uh, then of course, just the body lines here and the paint lines going up. Decent paint on this car. It's a it's relatively simple livery as far as Formula One liveries go, but it's, again, it's representative of what would have been on the car. Another loud beep coming. There we go. So again, it's the FW16. It's a storied car for all the wrong reasons, perhaps, but again, I uh, think we can reassess the, the reputation that it has, especially considering it, it was the steering column. It was not and a fundamental flaw with the car. And again, it's, it's not to diminish what happened. 
and it's not to disrespect certainly uh, Senna or anybody in the Williams team or or even Roland Ratzenberger for example because what happened at Imola 94 definitely deserves to be remembered it should be remembered and it has been the impetus for so many good things that have happened in Formula 1 since but at the same time I don't think the Williams deserves all the abject hatred that it gets because again at the end of the day it is a constructors championship winning car and there aren't all that many of those and there's only one of them every year so again this car did it and despite its challenges, despite the problems it had at the beginning of the season, and despite, of course, the unfortunate circumstances that befell Senna and befell the team at Imola, it came back to win the World Championship. It came to be driven by Nigel Mansell, and of course, Damon Hill would go on to win the World Championship with Williams in 1996. David Coulthard would stay with the team through 1995, and he would then move on to McLaren, but... Again, you have some big names who drove, who drove this car, and uh, again, just to cast it aside and say it was a terrible car, flawed from the start, killed Senna, you're missing the point, I must say. However, we do do all of this on the 1st of May because of what happened on that day in 1994, because of the memory of Ayrton Senna, because of the influential nature of his racing career, and really, also as a testament to everything that has come good since that fateful day. The changes since Imola 1994. The cars are stronger now. They've got anti-penetration panels in the cockpit. The circuits were fundamentally altered in many cases. Cornering speeds were slowed at many circuits. But more importantly, barriers were improved tremendously. An unprotected concrete barrier at Imola, if you really want to parse things, that is truly what caused the injury that Senna experienced. Because had that been a tire barrier, well, the wheel and tire going into the barrier would have been arrested rather than deflected. The car itself would have been slowed down rather than allowed to skid across the unprotected smooth concrete barrier. If you had a wider paved runoff, perhaps Senna could have gotten the car stopped before it even got to the barrier. So many things that could have been done that were not done simply because we didn't know at the time, but so much good did come from the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix that even though it is a tragedy in every sense of the word, to look at it only for the bad is to miss the true lessons therein. And the same goes with the reputation of this car. And again, just wanted to show it to you as a model and also just talk about the history of it and also defend the Williams FW16. Until next time, though, I do thank you all very much for watching Ferrari Mat 601. Saying thank you, and of course, we will see you soon.